Good morning and welcome everyone. This is uh, the fifth iteration of uh, our lecture series called Cyber Jagarupta Divas. Um, Saurav Raj is the speaker for today and I don't think so if he needs much of an introduction. This is the second time he's joining us. He has already uh, given us a brief introduction to uh, blockchain the last time he was here with us. But, uh, you know, just to uh, <clears throat> go with the flow of the water and uh, just to tell you, you know, a little bit about him, you know, in a very short uh, fashion. So Saurav is a BTEC from IIT Delhi, a 2004 batch, and uh, he's an alumni of the SPJAN FinTech program. He was the first ranker, by the way. And uh, he has worked extensively with Schlumberger in uh, India, Europe, and US as a operations and project manager, and uh, have led, uh, had led and deployed several corporate technology programs in the domain of uh, human resources, learning management systems, as well as payroll data capture and distribution. He's currently heading, uh, he's the head of the technology at the Settle First, incubated uh, under the MEITY STPI, APRE Gurugram uh, Blockchain Center of Excellence Program. So uh, this is basically the shortest kind of, uh, you know, as shortest and fastest uh, intro I could give to him. From here onwards, I'm just going to hand it over to Saurabh. Saurabh, uh, you know, over to you. Right. Uh, thank you, Saurabh, again. And uh, first of all, I would like, to uh, thank our director, sir. Uh, I mean, uh, the words of uh, encouragement and the vision that he has laid out and, and coming from the idea that blockchain as a technology is not only something which is to be seen and, and uh, be in awe of, but actually use it to solve real business problems and, and, and real day and everyday problems. And I think that is a great vision. And, and I think great uh, uh, outcomes are going to come out of uh, this initiative, sir. So, uh, and, and the reason why I share this is uh, five to six years back when I first heard about blockchain and I, and I was here in India and I looked around and, and, and there wasn't much of support or content or even uh, programs and initiatives like these, right? So, so today for you having to have that idea and concept that not only we will learn about it and, and study it, but also we will execute projects and build something on it. I, I think it is great. And, and I can say that it is not happening elsewhere. So definitely in this regard, I would say that uh, you sir have taken this initiative and you are definitely one of the very few and very first to do that in the entire country. Back then when, and, 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 and sort of mentioned, I, I went to SPGen. That was a time when I went around looking at all the IITs saying, do they teach something related to blockchain? And, and there was none. And the closest was that SPGN was the only institute giving such a you know, course and a, a program at that point of time. And within a year's time, uh, various management institutes and other online education providers came up with. Today, I am Calcutta also provides and I am Ahmedabad also. But specific to IITs where we are the uh, you know, technology center of excellences around in India and around the world, uh, taking on this uh, initiative, building the competency around new age, modern technologies, modern infrastructure, blockchain, uh, 3D, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, artificial re augmented reality, AR, VR, these things. And, and not only this, that they are fascinating technologies, but also the fact that these are the technologies that will decide how we live and interact in the modern digital world. So helping our students to come and learn about it, do projects. And, and then again, not only that, uh, I'm very thrilled to see that you're also saying that you'll be supporting the student projects through uh, commercial outcomes. I think that's the best motivation people could have today. We did not have it in uh, in our time. So I feel today to be part of the, uh, to be a student in your uh, institute is, is a great privilege. Sir. And I wish I could be there and uh, have this, but I will do my part as much as possible. And, and I've shared this with Saurav as well. Uh, in bringing we'll, try, that, uh, uh, we'll try our best to bring you here whenever it is <laughs> possible, right? As soon as the pandemic ends, we'll try our best to, you know, at least host you once here. Uh, definitely, that would be a great thing. So, so without much, I think for all the students here uh, who, are, who are attending and those who could not attend, I feel you are in a great position today that you are getting this opportunity, you're getting all that support and, and the financial uh, support also to take on something like this, which not many of them are having, right? Uh, so, so with that, I will start today's session. Uh, uh, for those of you who attended, uh, we did quite a bit of groundwork in the first one. And what I'll try to do is I'll build on that uh, in, the, in the same uh, way, and uh, we'll take it on from there, right? If there are any questions, uh, I'll stop somewhere around midway, let's say about 20-25 minutes, and we can have a round of questions. 
and then we can proceed. The whole idea is that you should try to understand the concepts today. Again, today we are not going to uh, get into code and actual development, but my effort will be to give you an understanding of how to approach this. And then it should leave you with an idea and a thought process so that you understand what blockchain can do as, as an infrastructure, as a tool. And then you go and see that, well, okay, I have this problem. Can I use blockchain and will it be useful to derive a certain extra value or improve the process, make it more efficient or reduce costs, right? So the entire reason of why we try to solve any business problem are for these three things, either, either to improve efficiencies, get more value out of that or reduce cost, make it process seamless for everyone who is participating in that process, right? So, so let us uh, start today and, uh, and, 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 and we'll stop for questions in the meanwhile. So this was a recap. Last time we talked about blockchain, what are transactions, digital ledger, consensus, uh, decentralization, uh, digital timestamps, records, all of these things, various things. And these are just to say a lot, quite a bit of the terminology that we uh, uh, come around when uh, talking about blockchain systems. Today, again, building on the previous one, I want to think of, I want you all to start thinking of blockchain as three building blocks. And not only blockchain, let's say anything we do in, in today's world is about three things, essentially, right? Let's say you, you're even going to uh, your local store, you know, to, to buy something, right? So the first thing is, you know the person, you know the shopkeeper, right? And, and if there is another shop which is open new, you most likely will not go to that new shop unless it's, he or she is selling something unique, right? So the first thing which comes is, you know the shopkeeper, the shopkeeper knows you. There is an establishment of identity, right? If you send someone very young as a small child or a kid to a shop, the shopkeeper may not sell him something straight away, right? So the establishment of identity is the first thing that happens and it, it is so natural that we don't even sometimes realize it. You walk in through your hostel door, probably there's a security. That security guy knows who you are. And that is why he lets you in. He does not ask you questions. He might even wave you a hello, hi, or something like that. But if it's someone he doesn't know, he will, the security guard inadvertently will stop that individual from entering the premises, right? And that is the first thing which happens. So now when you think about it, you go to a shopping mall, you don't go to your classroom, you see your professor, he's introduced to you after the first session, he knows who you are typically, right? So that is where you have established your identity. So that's the first thing which happens in every physical or digital interaction that we have today. The next thing which is there is, is a contract. And by contract, I mean, a certain rules of engagement. A contract says how two people or three people or any number of parties in a certain environment will interact with each other, right? For example, like in the case of this, this going to the local shop and buying something, let's say you want to buy one kg of rice. So that contract says that for that one kg of rice, which the shopkeeper will give you, you will hand in, for example, 100 rupees. That's a contract. Now, a similar form of a contract, same mode of same uh, amount, could be different that you could say, I will pay you 100 rupees now and you will deliver this one kg of rice to my home at this address. That's another contract where the delivery of goods is deferred. An alternative form of the same is what you practically or, or most likely do with all these online shopping is you pay it and then you get the product delivered online or sometimes you say cash on delivery. So these rules of engagement, you should see them as contracts, right? And then if you translate this concept to everything else that you're doing, once you've established identity, the next thing you do is you set those rules of engagement, right? So that becomes our second building block. The third building block, and of course, the most critical one is the payment itself, right? You say what has to be paid and how much of it has to be paid, right? And the contract actually tells you when to pay it. For example, in the cash uh, on delivery, you, the contract says that you should make a payment of 100 rupees once you have received the goods. For example, in many cases in business environments, uh, uh, companies will raise a PO and then you can raise an invoice against which a payment to be made. That is again captured in the contract and when you raise invoices, you get payments for it, right? So business interactions, a simple local buying experience, even for example, going, you know, your, your students, right? Going to your uh, uh, school and colleges and, and classrooms. It's a simple thing. Your identity is established because you passed the exams, you have been enrolled in a certain program, 
and, and with a certain roll number, that's your identity. The contract here is that you will get a certain number of courses, you will get certain uh, uh, lectures, uh, certain lab exercises, certain tests, and you have to pass those tests, right? And that is when the contract says, that if you pass, if you do all of these things, you will get a course completion certificate. That's the contract. And the payment is, of course, the, uh, the fees that you have paid, right? And, 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 and then you see this, if you, if you think about these three building blocks, you can typically apply it to any real physical world or a digital interaction. And this is where we will try to see how blockchain can be used as a digital infrastructure in the modern world. So going ahead, let us see as, as, as mostly we talk about identity and now we're talking about digital, what a digital identity means, right? So in very simple terms, and, and this is something I, I try to pick up, you know, very simple words and something if you even try to search it, you will get it. So it's, it's easy reference. It says that digital identity is information about any entity, right? And, and because it is digital, it is typically used by computer systems to represent something, right? Now, this entity could be a person, could be an organization, could be even an application or a device, right? So person, when we say about digital identity, it could be your, uh, for example, Aadhaar card number, right? For your school or for your college, for your courses, it is your enrollment number, right? So, so this typically an identity. If you go to a hospital, some of these hospitals will give you a patient reference number, right? So that's again an identity, right? An organization, for example, is typically registered by, uh, with the government authorities. Uh, for example, you have a GST number, right? That's an identity information for an organization. You have a PAN card. People also can have PAN cards. Even companies also have PAN cards. So those, that again forms a piece of identity. Now applications, you know, for example, if you go to Play Store or App Store or Google App Stores on uh, anywhere, you see every application is registered with an ID. Now that ID uniquely identifies this application or even devices, right? I mean, from if, if you're from the computing knowledge, you would know that every device comes with a MAC address that uniquely identifies that particular device, be it a computer, a laptop, a desktop, a smartphone, uh, an IoT device, each one of them has a MAC address and that forms the identity, right? So, so that's what forms the identity or, or in the simple ISO terms, it's just a set of attributes which can identify a particular identity. Now, the distinction here is not everything is a digital identity, right? And we will come back and touch on this point a little bit later with a certain example. So remember that there is an identity and there is a digital identity, right? The next important topic to understand here is self-sovereign identity. And, and if you talk about blockchain world, uh, this inadvertently will come at some point of the fact that you know we are doing SSI or we are building a, a self-sovereign identity system, right? But actually, what does it mean? And, and why is it so important? Why do people go crazy about this fact at all, right? And we have our so many identities and we barely manage to keep and remember all of them. So many email addresses, so many bank account numbers, everything is there, right? Why is this important? The sole concept of this is that this gives an individual, each one of us, in control of our digital identities, right? And, and it is relevant because in, in a system where you cannot always identify the other person, this is exactly where it becomes useful, right? For example, I gave you that example of, you know, some visitor who is trying to come to your hostel premises, as much as I remember, you know, a security guard is there. If he doesn't remember, or if he doesn't know who the person is, he will stop and ask for an identity, right? Typically, it might happen in your security campus also. It's a big campus. You go from one uh, department to the other. Sometimes there's someone who might ask you to show your ID card, right? And that's basically you are trying to establish the trust that you are a person, you are a valid ID holder. You have certain credentials which should allow you to enter and access those, uh, that public infrastructure, be it a room, be it a meeting room, be it a classroom or anything for that matter, right? So, so what happens from there is that you have to establish trust, right? And, and when it comes to the concept of uh, self-sovereign identity, it's always a three participant rule, which means the trust is there. Now, the question here is, let's say the same security guy is in your hostel room. I go and, and, and show him an ID card, right? Now, typically people show PAN cards, Aadhaar card, sometimes a voter license, sometimes a driving license. Many of these things can be shown, right? How do, or how does this security guard actually know that that is an actual identity card and it's not a fake one, right? How does he trust this individual who has presented these credentials, right? 
there is no way for him to know, right? He just has to look at your face or look at the car and say, maybe you are this person, right? There's always a question. And the question he's trying to answer is, are you the person who you claim to be? While it is easier to do that in person because you know of the certain semantics and the cognitive abilities that we have, but imagine a machine trying to do that, right? You enter your PAN card or Aadhaar card number, but how does this machine know that it is actually correct? Because this machine cannot even see you, right? In most uh, general scenarios, right? So that is where this trust triangle comes in and, and the three participant schema, right? So if you look at this, this is how actually it always works, right? So there is an issuer, right? Which is the issuing organization for it. In this case, if you, let's say if it's a PAN card, then it is issued by NSDL, right? If it's Aadhaar card, it is issued by UIDAI, which are government mandated entities of centrally managing and uh, distributing these identities. In the case of your enrollment ID, it is your institution who is giving you this enrollment identity when you have successfully registered for the entire program, be it a BTEC, be it MTEC, be it a PhD, research, management, any course, right? So this is becomes the issuer. Now you as an individual, we all as individuals, we are the holders of this identity. And then there is a question of very fair. So now if we apply this scenario to the case of our, you know, uh, this gentleman security guard who's at the hostel gate, he is the verifier. Now, what you have done is you have taken your identity card in some short, uh, sorted form and you have presented to it. Now, what this happens is this verifier looks at that identity card and best case, if there's a photo, he or she will try to match that photo. That's the basic thing which someone can do, right? But that actually is just validating the identity and the card that, okay, this card matches you. But it does not still tell you that if that card or that number, whatever is on that card, is correct or not, right? And that is where the digital part of the digital identity comes that the issuer has noted that that reference number, that that unique ID belongs to a certain person here and that it can be verified in real time, right? And that is where the, uh, the credentials are said to be authenticated, right? And that is what a typical verifier will do. Let's say if he has a terminal or a mobile app or something, he will punch in that number and pull those records directly from the source, right? And this is what happens. So it's always a three party, which is the issuer, the verifier, and the person who is holding and presenting these credentials. And then there is an element of authentication and verification here, which happens. And that actually what makes this a digital identity. For example, now if we go, you say, typically we had so many identities before we had uh, if you remember the old times, voter card was there and then there used to be a Russian card, right? And, and these were sort of identities because these were uniquely tied to families and individuals, right? But then we went on from there to making a PAN card, right? Which was something done for, you know, filing taxes and returns and all that commercial stuff, right? All the financial stuff. Even that was not sufficient. Then there was a need to come up with something called an Aadhaar card. Now, if you see the difference, what, what, what we talked about, an identity versus a digital identity, you will then realize that why Aadhaar card is actually what we need. That is the first form of digital identity that India has. Now, everything else, yes, today, there are ways in which you can validate a PAN card, where you can also validate a, a, a driver license or these. But when Aadhaar card was coming around, these were not readily available. You could only show the photo or the card but there was no means of doing this, this verification from the source. When Aadhaar card came, it was the first way of actually verifying who that Aadhaar card belongs to. And that is why if you talk about digital identity in the scope of, of India as a country, Aadhaar is, the, is our digital identity. Everything else, which is verification today, you can do it via APIs, you can do uh, services, there are people who provide the verifications. Those are something which is have come later on. So that is where concept of identity, moving from there to digital identity and then to self-sovereign identity, right? And this is what, if you remember this picture, it will be very clear anytime now you go and do that interaction, you will know what is happening and what is not happening. The other reason also this helps to understand is if you were to build such a system, let's say you will now go out, uh, you will join companies, you'll work in different places. And if you're working on an identity problem, right? You will remember this and you will know how to build and design such a system, right? If this doesn't happen, there is no way you can authenticate a person uh, uh, who or he who that person is and how who she's claiming to be and, and all these you know you might see some uh, in movies you know they, they show you that you know there's an international criminal who is running around and he has 
six passports on his bags and you know multiple currencies there is us dollar there is usd there is you know all sorts of things and this is actually they are doing they have to make sure that this is registered here and and it's all movie and, and graphics but without this it doesn't work right and that is where all these concept of fake identities come because when you try to verify them this fails right so that is how you know uh, this doesn't happen and when you design certain systems cyber crime and identity theft this is what you have to make sure of right so typically just a closing note on this if you talk about identity theft what people try to do is they try to take these credentials and they try to verify it against you and that is why it's done if it's done properly your identity can entirely be taken they can go and they can hack into this system and maybe change your photo and then use the same name right so that is what you know losing your identity is and then there are digital ways of doing it and there are digital ways of again restoring your identity so that's it's, it's a big thing right and 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 post covid as most of the things start to move digital there's something which you know we talked about in the last session also you should try to think of it do not try to give your pan card aadhar card you know these things in different systems and just leave it there always think why a person is requiring it why the person is needing it and if it does not need to be stored in a certain third party database or somewhere do not store it do not give it right it's simple today in india we are still in early stages of these things in western country these things are much more developed and so is the crime and the and the way these crimes are done in india again thanks to our population people are less bothered about it right and we certainly don't have the technical knowledge to implement such kind of hacks but then once in a while you always get this news on the internet that you know uh, 10000 uh, email addresses or 10000 cards of people were leaked out and you know posted on the internet and so on right so so imagine if someone has not implemented a good security infrastructure your data residing with those companies those those organizations are at risk of being hacked right so aligned with the theme of cyber jagrukta divas this is something which you know i always try to bring to your attention so you understand it share it with others even your parents because they might sometimes not know they did not grow up with a time where these things were relevant it is relevant today and it is going to be relevant for in uh, going uh, forward right so that is why identity is important so this is a point where uh, probably i can say uh, if you if you have certain questions we can uh, take it uh, and uh, answer it before we move on to the next part so anyone from the audience with any questions okay i think we can we can move forward we can move yeah sure so so from now on what we will do is we will get into something really interesting and more on the sort of applications and how do we see identity in in the real world right so this is a picture which which it, it took me a while to come to this picture minus the fancy graphics i want to look at it as as what sort of identity and data that we have now uh, you know there is something which is called a gdpr there's personal data protection bill which is already tabled in the parliament and i believe the next government when they come into the action they'll take course on it but data is relevant data is important and that defines who we are to people we don't know right so so when you talk about personal identity there are various aspects to it the first is of course what we talked about so far this pan aadhar card uh, driver license and so on and so forth these form let's say our identity credentials most of which are given by our government uh, bodies municipal authorities and so on and so forth because these are institutions that in advertently we go and we trust and anything which comes out of them we'll say yes this is correct right otherwise and and every country has it that is the system which is set up across the entire world and that is something we do now if we move on from there the next thing which happens typically is when you start working for a company you get a company id or a badge or an email right and those start to form your work authorization so typically what you see on linkedin is actually some of that that information which is being put publicly right but the fact is nothing on linkedin can be verified i can go and write anything on linkedin that i am the uh, you know uh, president or uh, you know uh, chief of xyz at you know some company right there is no way to verify it right so that verification authentication on linkedin cannot happen so while you can look at it as a social reference as a proof but actually you cannot be certain of what people are writing on it most likely we trust people have good behavior and they will write that you know if they are working in a company they are if they have achieved if they are studying in some college if they are uh, you know if they have a certain awards and credentials they are actually writing it but be aware of the fact that it can also be incorrect 
right? The next is, of course, which is very relevant to all of us here is academic credentials, like your degree, your passing, your course grade certificates. Uh, some of you be doing uh, online courses, you know, from uh, outside campus also. Uh, there are many these online educational platforms. So, you know, all of those come in the academic credentials, right? Financial data is something, again, uh, uh, it's related to your bank accounts, bank IDs, uh, your loan and insurance documents and numbers. So each of these, you know, see documents come with a unique reference number, right? So those, that again forms and identifies who, who you are to the bank. Now, talking about medical and medical history, again, for example, you know, typically we talk about DNA and all and uh, your blood group and matches and all of this. That again has a unique fingerprinting, right? So, you know, it, it can be used to identify a unique person. But for the sake of our discussion of what we can actually use in the practical world, let's say today one of the best examples is a, is a, is a, is a RT-PCR report, right? Which you many times if you're traveling, uh, it's almost becoming the norm that either you present a COVID certification or you present the RT-PCR, depending on where you are going from and where you are coming. Yeah. I mean, where you're coming uh, from and where you are going to, right? The next part of your identity and data is your assets and ownership. For example, you might have a house somewhere, you might have, a piece of land, you might be having some apartment uh, or even a car or a fridge, you know, everything that is in the physical asset, right? There is a proof of purchase, which actually says that you own it, this, this asset, right? And think of everything as an asset, right? Now, the other thing is with blockchain, what comes is it makes it possible for that asset to be divided into smaller units and made it as fractions, right? The reason why that is possible is because of the fact that data on blockchain is trustworthy and you can trust it. So for example, let's say in the case of a house or an apartment, it has been sold five times, right? And if you record that information on blockchain, then you most certainly know that this is the chain of custody or you know this is a chain of ownership or the history of ownership for this particular house. Typically that is done today with uh, registrar offices, Bureau of Land Records and all of those things. Now in many cases that is challenging because some of these records go days old, some, some of this even predates the time when, you know, the accounting and the uh, creation of records came, right? And that is sometimes which actually leads to disputes, right? And, and, and that is where. So if you have something related to blockchain on that, actually it becomes very, very certifiable, right? And the last piece of it is where the social aspect of it is. For example, belonging to a, uh, a technical uh, uh, group, right? For example, as uh, directors have mentioned, you know, there'll be uh, possibility of coming up these uh, technical societies where, you know, students get part of it, right? Those again form your identity because, you know, there are many professional institutes around the world. For example, uh, you know, it could be Society of Petroleum Engineers, Society of Mechanical Engineers, American Society of XYZ, right? These are memberships that people have. These are very, very valuable, right? And they, in many times, give you certain accesses or privileges in certain places. For example, let's say many of you, when you pass out from, uh, you know, your IIT programs, you will see that many places where you go and say, well, I passed from IIT and, and, you know, this is my, you know, alumni card or something, you will say that it might unlock you benefits, right? And, and that is why this is very, very important. Now, someone else who comes and says that I'm also passed out of uh, IIT, ISM, Dunbar, well, if that person is not actually passed out from there, then, you know, it's, it's a case of a fraud, right? So, so that is where this is, again, something very, very interesting. So the idea, the thought to take from here is your identity and your data, <clears throat> as it is known, is a composite of many, many things, right? We just think of that as identity is presenting, you know, your Aadhaar card or PAN card or driver license. But if you just take a step back and look at this and remember this, this image and, and, and all these different areas, you will now realize that your you and your identity is much more than just one card, right? It is a collective of various identities which come out of interactions with various uh, groups, with various people, with organizations and with different entities, right? And that is what you have to always take the effort of protecting and keeping it safe. So we talked about this and, and this is where I, I, I mentioned before that we will come to this point and, and we will talk about a certain uh, factor of what, what is a digital identity. So we understood that uh, Aadhaar card was, and, and is typically our first digital identity in India, but let's say about voter card, right? Will that be considered as a digital identity? Uh, uh, anyone who would like to uh, take a shot on this answer? Compared to Aadhaar, would you think a voter card is a considerable uh, digital identity that we can use in, in, in 
you know our our uh, interactions or let's say open a bank account or something do you think it's trustworthy enough to use that anyone who would like to take a shot on this so i feel because we are not really storing any uh, bio bioinformatics related uh, information um, this is something that is easily forgeable and you know someone can easily uh, take advantage of this that is my my perception correct, correct. And, and it is absolutely on point and 100% correct and that is why the repercussion of this and we will take this in a very light mode that you know when elections happen right why is it always that there is a scam around elections because of the fact that what uh, uh, saurav sir just mentioned is that you cannot always be certain of who's using this because you cannot authenticate it you cannot verify it in real time and believe me it is not happening today but india will move to a point where you will be able to vote and i think it's already happening so you know i think in the last election it happened but still offline a bit uh, that you will use your aadhar card to cast a vote and it will be one vote one card that's it right so you know typically today it happens that you know these things uh, uh, scam of votes and these things happen when we move to a digital system where we actually move this identity it will be uh, elections would be fair and that is where you can say right so this is this is why concept of digital identity and a real world application is very important now let's say for example you want to take it to your you know institution right and the same concept can apply there for example if your institute gives you a, a, an id card or a badge or something think of it that the many places where you actually go and show that as a proof right maybe within the campus there is a canteen which actually gives you 20% discount on food right and if you were coming from outside it's not uh, discounted for you right so a normal person would not get the same discount as someone i mean i we used to get it right i mean i remember the canteen when we used to go as students we would get a uh, uh, three to four parathas and you know this dal makhani at just 10 rupees and that was just a discounted rate uh if you were at the campus and we did not want to go to the hostel because it was a long walk and that's how you know the the delhi campuses you will see there was a canteen which would give us this you know a, a very good decent you know of the lunch uh, and it was very simple it was rajma chawal and that was for 5 rupees and you are good for the day if you take two times you probably will end up overeating it but if you are coming from outside there was no way you could get it for 5 rupees and and that's plain simple right so you see the privileges of having the right identity are very very practical now so now think of it as a scenario that if you were to build a practical system of securing the access and controls and privileges within the campus maybe now you could take on as a project build it conceptualize it around and then kind of see that you could come up with a certain digital identity which is verifiable like we said it should be verifiable in real time and that can actually prove who the person is holding the card it could be used for access to certain labs certain uh, areas of the campus canteens discounts and all of that and you can build that on a unique campus card for the person someone is coming in as a guest if that uh, that person will not have this uh, card so that person does not get the required benefits right so that is where now you see between the concept of what a digital identity is what it can do and how you can implement it right and 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 that is something which is useful to take it from here now moving on uh, we talked about work credentials right so again uh, in many cases uh, you will see uh, you you get a badge and a company id and that is what you can swipe at the door and go in and many of you once you pass out you see that you will get this in some form or shape right what is happening these days is and why i put this picture in the center is these are also becoming digital right so if you have now with qr codes becoming more and more popular most likely you will have this digital card sitting on your mobile phone you will open it up you will scan it against some device and you will get access to this right now the idea is what kind of credentials it can be and it can be used to identify is also it can identify your various roles for example you could be a full time employee you could be a contractor you could be an intern or it could be used to give even awards to your individual self right and this actually makes up your work history Uh, which goes into your resume uh, recognizes certain skills and awards that you have it could be even to identify what compensation bonus you should have right so it is all tied to your work credentials so that is why these are very very uh, important concepts and kind of form the infrastructure of what we do everything has built on this identities right so so that is why we we take very care to protect it now 
The last part, which we said is uh, very interesting, specific to academics, is our achievements. In, either it could be in person and, and with school, college, or even online courses that we do, right? Now, what these includes is your all courses, you know, your lab marks, your certificates, your mark sheets, even awards. Some of you are writing research papers. And, and you know, I mean, when you write research papers, you do it with two or three people, or even your BTEC projects, right? Many of you will be publishing the white papers and light papers and, and so on and so forth in IEEE's and all that stuff, right? And you get certain credentials, right? When you go and present these, you actually very proudly go and say that I presented a paper and, and these are my co-authors, right? That is actually a certain credential, right? And that is what, what adds to your value. It adds to your reputation, right? So that is why it is important. And of course, having certificates like these are just a recognition that you can present it physically in form of people but now as things move digital you will see how all of this scenario can change and it becomes very very dynamic and interesting and finally the last part we touched a little bit is is about memberships uh, these again uh, could be of various form and shape uh, it could be related to memberships at work or school let's say even your gym membership can be here right rotary clubs or theme based or social then again the other aspect of this is it could have a certain defined uh, start and end date for example you know your uh, club membership of your, uh, let's say, blockchain uh, uh, club, special interest group in your, could be as long as you are a student, right? So the day you stop being a student, you become an alumni, that day you cease to be an active member of the club, you might become a member of the club or, or a mentor at the club, right? So there are different things, right? Or sometimes it could be lifetime. For example, the moment you complete your degree, you become an, an alumni, and an alumni membership is a lifetime membership, right? And then again, there are some of those for example, various clubs like a sports club or a gym or a rotary club where you can pay a little bit subscription or sometimes it could be free as well, right? So you see that all of these either tie into a certain form and shape of identity, which actually defines you. And then there is a certain payment to be made. And if you go back, we said the third, uh, one of the three uh, building blocks was the contract, which means it says that based on this identity, based on this amount of payment, these are certain rules of engagement. These are certain things that you can do and these are certain things you cannot do, right? So going back, this is where, you know, I want to conclude at this point, you know, the, the entire gist of it is, is always remember, try to think of it as, as these three building blocks, as what your identity is, what are you getting there? What is the contract, rules of engagement? And if there is a payment component to it and how it has to be done, which is again, defined by what the contract says, right? So fair enough, at this point of time, now something very interesting which will come, which is again, very, very practical to, you know, the modern way of how things have changed post COVID is something like an attendance protocol, right? And, and director sir is here, so I'll, I'll say this in a light note. And today it's, it's much longer, so I can say that there were courses that, you know, people bunk or people miss a certain course, or maybe it's winter and you, it's an 8 a.m. course and, and, and you could not attend it, right? But, for having to pass a certain course, and, 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 and our professors used to do it, and, and, and they used to force us that say, if you don't have 60% attendance, you will not be allowed to sit for the final exam. You will fail the course inadvertently. I mean, there is no way you can save it. And sometimes if they were nice professors, you go, uh, you plead to them, they'll say, okay, you know, write a paper and, you know, present it to the class. And, you know, I'll give you certain extra credits to make it up for the loss of attendance, right? And that was still easy because, you knew you had a class of 40 students doing a course and it was running for three to four months and people knew each other, right? But now what has happened is there's actually many things happening online, right? So if, when it's online, you don't know who the person is and where he or she is sitting, right? I mean, for all that matters, you know, someone else is logged into the computer and, and who knows, right? So so now what has come up is, is an attendance protocol, right? Which is, it, it's a very new concept and it's a very interesting concept. And, and the fact is, why is it relevant today, right? So before I jump into it, let me just quickly introduce what this attendance protocol means. It simply says that it's a protocol which creates digital badges, right? Or collectibles, right? For example, in the previous slide, we talked about these kind of certificates, right? So imagine these are all digital, for example, images, badges, right? You know, like, you know, we could collect, right? Similarly, uh, that can happen. Now, so you have these badges, and these badges are given to you on the basis of your attending a particular event. For example, this seminar, 
and, and probably if we do a next one, we'll actually do it, uh, uh, you know, an actual demo and, and see how it works. So what happens is now we have been in this session for about, I think, uh, 45 to 50 minutes, right? So yes, just about, just about under an hour. So as part of this protocol, I could say that everyone who has, who is still present in this meeting at 55 minutes since the start will get an attendance for this event. Now imagine this, when you're doing courses online, uh, uh, your professors would come and say that if you have attended the, the entire lecture for 55 minutes, you will be marked present for this course, right? And that is how it is, so which means you need to be present. Now they could make it uh, a very interesting fact, which is again, uh, the logic to implement. Uh, the example which I came is, uh, gave is a duration for 55 minutes. It could be like, okay, you know, you have to be present for three times during the, the entire session. And I could randomly present uh, the attendance token at any point in the, in, during this uh, 60 minutes, right? So, which means there is no way that you know that, well, you know, yes, sir, so, you know, last five minutes of attendance later, so I just have to be into the class. I can sneak in from the back door, sit on the last bench 10 minutes before the class. We have done that. I also did it at some point of time. Not very proud of it, but <laughs> the idea is we have to understand now how things are being different and how we can leverage blockchain as a technology infrastructure to actually achieve this and build a real world solution around it, right? And that brings me to one of the final uh, concepts to talk about today, which is a fungible versus a non-fungible token. How the world of blockchain has evolved in the recent times and, and what is something which is very, very dynamic and happening, right? So, Let's just talk about tokens, right? Essentially, everything which happens on blockchain is via tokens. Tokens, in a simple way, are something which represent value, right? That value could be a monetary value, it could be an emotional value, or it could be something as a perceived value. Now, in terms of value, a fungible token, I would say in the real world, what we call as a 100 rupee note. It has a value that note is a physical object, it is fungible, because the fact that it has a property, which means that that 100 rupees note is always going to be 100 rupees. It is 100 rupees today, it is 100 rupees tomorrow. If I give it to Saurav sir, it will still be 100 rupees, right? And that is a very unique criteria of being called a fungible token, right? It is exactly the same and, and, and also the same to another 100 rupee note. So if there are 200 rupee notes, they're exactly the same, same value, right? Be it with anyone, right? The second factor is that it is transferable. You can exchange it, you can count it, you can trade it and there is a value to it. So examples, every currency is a fungible token, your crypto tokens, your cryptocurrencies, loyalty points. You know, if I have five loyalty points with, uh, for example, uh, 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 let's say uh, Society of uh, Mechanical Engineers and, and uh, someone else has five points, those five points are exactly the same, right? And, and, and what makes it interesting in case of blockchain is that these are programmable. Right, so what the, the concept here is programmable money, right? So money, it, it's a misnomer in the fact that money is never programmable. And actually you don't want it to be programmable because if money were programmable, I have 100 rupees and someone writes a program saying that, well, this 100 rupees value is now becoming 90 rupees. That is not good. What programmable money actually means is that you can build a business logic around it on how it is transferred, counted, traded and exchanged. You could say that my program says, that uh, at the start of the semester, I will pick five courses. And as soon as I pick five courses, please deposit the uh, semester fees into this account. That's making it programmable, right? Today, what you have to do is, uh, well, that is what we used to do is every semester we used to get a check, go back to our single SBI counter uh, and make a huge line. And, and that was a good excuse for not ending the first pass, but, <laughs> but you had to do that deposit. And the second fact that we had to do it, another one for the mess which was kind of always surprising that, you know, you are in the same institute, you are in, the, in your hostel, the hostel is, the, the, the student mess is part of the hostel uh, and the canteen and everything, part of the same infrastructure. And you have a program and you have already paid the fees, but you have to do it in two places. And suddenly sometimes someone would miss it. For example, you know, you, 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 from your house, uh, someone did not send the check or you forgot to deposit it or you don't know where it is. And suddenly after three weeks, you see, you know, you go for lunch or dinner, there's a big notice saying, these are the people who have not paid their mess fees. Please pay, otherwise fine will be there. And you are like, well, how can we avoid this, right? And that is the whole thing, right? Today it is possible. And that is where 
we talk about programmable money with smart content. So that's, there you go. It's another business case of how you could streamline your campus infrastructure with these things, right? And, and finally, the interesting one, we talked about non-fungible token. So what non-fungible token is, is something which is very unique. What it means in contrast to a fungible token is if I have a token, if you have a token, those are two different entities completely. It cannot be the same. And that is what is at the basis of what a non-fungible token is, right? In most of the current scenarios, what has happened is it is giving this content creators, right? When you write a blog piece or you create music or you create art, right? Why does an art by you know, some of the greatest painters in the world have so much value because there's only a limited amount of it, right? You know, the classic case, case of supply versus demand, something which is in short supply and great demand has a lot of value. If there is only one piece, for example, our Taj Mahal, it's, it's the one in the world, right? There's nothing else like it. And that is why it's great value, so much value that you cannot even buy it today, right? And that is the power of it, right? So, so what it is, NFTs are something which is very unique. It has been so far used extensively uh, in the music industry for protecting rights and IP, uh, for your art collections and all of these things, right? So that is why uh, it is powerful. And again, you can have contracts or smart contract or uh, you know, programs written around it, again, to see how it can be transferred or not transferred, right? An example of this thing is sometimes when you see in movies, like, you know, we, you might have watched movies, you know, and you see that, uh, uh, there is a certain condition that if this happens, then this person gets some amount of money. Someone wins a lottery or, or, or something else happens, right? So those are again, something, various items that you can program it on smart contracts. Like for example, of uh, delayed fees. Again, it can be programmed in smart contracts, right? Now, I talked about non-fungible tokens. I talked a lot about digital identities and identity and how the different forms of identity are. Now imagine, you implement all of these identities because there are so many of them, like we saw in this example, you can have so many identities. It's like, if you just print them, and if you walk out of your school at, at, by this stage, if you collect all the certificates you had, you would actually have a big binder in your hands, right? Like, you know, you, 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 you went to a sing, you won a singing competition in class five and then a, a 500 meter race or a 600 meter race in class 10. And then you went to some sports. Then you presented this competition. You come up, now you all your grades. You actually will end up having a binder of all these, you know, certificates and everything, right? But imagine now you create NFTs for all of those, right? Which means now you can digitally have it. The second thing is all of them are actually correct, right? I mean, if it's a physical certificate, you could actually take it to a local stationery. Today, technology is there. I mean, a local stationery guy is sitting there. They also design and do all these things. They can actually reprint a second certificate for you, give it to you or even in your friend's name or neighbor's name. Right? That can happen today. And it is happening in some places, right? So what happens is to secure that infrastructure, right? To secure these credentials, to secure these awards. Why? Because there are two aspects to it. One, if someone is carrying a certificate, let's say it's a fake certificate, it should be IIT, then it's damaging to the brand reputation of IITs as well, because that person does not have the capability or the ability to be a student of IIT. And of course, if there's a test or something, he will fail. Now, someone who is administering the test will think that, well, this guy came out of IIT and this photo kush bhi aata. So the guy is already gone, but what happens is it creates a question mark on the IITs itself that pata nahi log kya padha rahe. today they will say, you know, pata nahi, IITs mein kuch padhate ki nahi, ye dekho ek aya da manda, so kuch bhi nahi aata. And then that is because this guy posts with a fake certificate saying, I was a student of IIT, but actually he is not, right? So it damages the brand rep reputation of this company, of IITs. The second thing what happens is, imagine you're going to uh, a, a job interview, right? You're in a room of six people, right? And let's say four of them have come with right credentials and there are two of them with fake identities, right? And let's say they're smart enough to actually do a great conversation and have very good discussions with the interviewer. And the interview will say, well, all of you are from IIT graduates, very good, but this guy talks very nice. So let me take him, right? So I know the credentials are right. Let me take him. But what actually happened is there was a wrong decision made because the fact that everyone has a certificate and a degree from IIT is not correct, which was the qualifying criteria. So what happens is you as an individual lost that opportunity of being hired for the job 
where someone else presented a fake identity and got their job in your place. So the question of fake identities, fake certificates, fake degrees is much more than what you see. It, it damages the reputation of the institution as well. And it reduces the opportunity for you to get into that job, get into that mode, get that opportunity and someone else got it, right? So that is why there's a lot of focus coming on this. And this is where before it was not possible to do this in blockchain for a very simple reason, which I'll come in the next part. Let me just close the topic on non-fungible tokens. Why this is big? And like I said, today, a lot of it is happening on NFTs in the art world and the creators. If you go, I would like to just share this news. This is one of the biggest news that made headlines early this year is OpenSea. OpenSea is a platform. If you go and search it, you can see OpenSea.com. I think that's the website. Let me see. I, I think I have it open here somewhere. Yes. So this is what you call OpenSea. And this is like a marketplace, right? What people come and people come and they, you can see discover, collect and sell extraordinary NFTs, right? So what happens is that creators, their artists, their music uh, creators and all those, uh, those kind of creative people, they come and they create this digital art and people actually go and buy it, right? And they collect it, right? So this is like a creators and collectors economy, right? Imagine you have a painting by one of the, uh, let's say, uh, you know, Picasso, right? You keep it. It has a certain value which appreciates over time because there are only a few of it, right? So this is such a marketplace where people come, they create different kinds of arts, they put it there, people buy it, and that is what is happening. There are live auctions and there are so many things. There are, you know, uh, these contests where people buy, you see the price appreciation is there. It's it's a huge economy. It's, it's just massive in its own domain, right? And you see, of course, some of it, you know, it doesn't appreciate over time. So they can also lose value, right? So, you know, like they say, Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, right? So that is the concept which also works here, right? So, so this is very interesting. Take a look at it. I mean, it will help you understand. They have some good resources here, right? Various categories. You can see there's art, there's collectible. Even domain names are, are being sold, right? Music, photography, right? And, and so many things. So this was the world of NFT, NFTs is just exploding. And for a very simple reason, why? In the previous session, we talked about blockchain and what blockchain does is it is essentially a ledger, ledger of transactions. And that is what it is. It's just records transactions, right? And blockchains are typically designed not to store data. They are just to record a transaction, which means the data in a blockchain is very, very limited. Now to do all of this, for example, imagine trying to store a, a, a fancy image, which could be a few GBs, right? That cannot go on blockchain because it is not designed for it. Right. So the previous version of the blockchain, the way it existed before was limiting. We could not do many things. Yes, we could do quite a bit. We could go from the fact that no one could trust a transaction to the point that we could trust a transaction. And if someone said they made 100 rupees of payment for such and such thing, we could actually go and verify. It. That was great. But we could not actually store the details and a graphic of something of what was actually sold. Now we can. We can do that with NFT. So Imagine NFTs as the trust of the blockchain systems of the transaction of that, you know, proof that a transaction exists, plus the concept of data. And data can represent anything. So now, as we talk about a modern infrastructure today, you have something to record what the transactions are and something to also record what is being transacted, right? And of course, you have the smart contract layer. So going back to the fact now we started, we say blockchain as an infrastructure. So those three building blocks, identity, you can create these identity uh, cards and this digital as, as NFTs, which again are very unique and very purpose fit for this. You can store them on blockchain via uh, these uh, records and you can have transactions related to it. So now if you just use blockchain infrastructure, you can have these NFT based identity protocols everywhere, right? And then you get rid of all the infrastructure, all the program logic that you have to build. So for example, now you can say that I have built, uh, I have given, I have recorded my uh, college identity cards on the blockchain, which means anywhere I go now, I don't need to do it. It can be verified instantly because the record exists. The server doesn't go down. So it works 24, 7, 365 days a year, right? Which is very essential because Imagine you are trying to, you know, if it's your birthday and, and you know, you're running it, your identity protocols are running from a server and the server goes down. Servers go down, right? I mean, it's part of machines, right? Just a few days back, 
uh, we all got emails from the DigiLocker, right? DigiLocker is, you know, it's an identity protocol run by the government of India under my team, right? They said that we are having uh, DNS issues and that is why our servers are not responding to DigiLocker queries. Now imagine if that happens, right? Your entire country's digital identity infrastructure is gone because you know, you know, your servers are down. There is a DNS issue, right? Which you cannot resolve. And probably it was big enough for someone as big as DigiLocker, the government to come and actually apologize to all its stakeholders saying, we are having an issue, we are going to fix it and we'll come back to you. So imagine if a digital infrastructure and identity infrastructure does not work or it stops to work, it goes down for a certain time. Everything stops working, right? And the blockchain systems, by the fact that they're running 24 seven, they don't, don't go down. This is where if you build an infrastructure on blockchain for identity, it, it is going to be a massive leap for, for everything that you build on top of it. And with that, once you have that, you don't need to build anything. You, you can then say based on rules that, okay, if you have an, a, a student identity NFT recorded on blockchain, you can get access to these things. You can get a, a, a free you know, a coupon on your birthday and you can record your birthday and you can say, well, if you swipe your uh, card, uh, your digital identity card uh, in this canton on your birthday, you get a free ice cream. Right? I mean, how good is that? You didn't have to do anything. You did not even have to disclose that it was your birthday and that's it. So you protected your information, you have the records available and you were able to get these new opportunities. And that is where I wanted to bring to you today that using modern tools and what it is possible today with blockchain and, 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 and the infrastructure that is available. Sorry, this is the wrong one. <laughs> You can do a lot of things, right? So, so that is what mostly I wanted to cover today, right? And 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 this also gives various ideas throughout. I, I refer to some of the interesting things that, you know, now that these uh, uh, committees and stuff will form, you can start to look at some of these things. Uh, start internally because uh, that's one of the best things to do because you interact with the systems, with this environment on a daily basis. You know, your courses, your canteens, your uh, security gates, all of these. And, and form teams and see if you were to build a single you know, blockchain infrastructure for the entire campus, how would you do it, right? And it ends a very vibrant, very interesting ecosystem, right? It's very rich. You could have, you know, you could have awards given for your uh, student activities, cultural activities. You know, you have these music competitions, your essay writing, speech, sport, right? Why not, you know, create these uh, digital certificates for them and award it to students. So next time where they go, it is recorded in blockchain, it stays with them forever, right? And it can be verified in real time. For example, imagine a blockchain based your profile for all your credentials and awards and everything like LinkedIn. LinkedIn, nothing is verified. But here you can have your campus page where anyone who goes and you know it's a URL which is with your uh, enrollment ID, which is always fixed, it doesn't change. And there you go, it lists all your certifications. How cool would that be, right? And, and it takes no uh, amount of pain to do that. And, you know, you can proudly present it anywhere you go, right? And brings great reputation to the Institute and to all of its students, right? So, so this, was, this was what I wanted to cover, bring you a bridge from what we had established as a baseline introduction from what blockchain is, what it can do, to today, what actually is happening on blockchain, some of the very recent, uh, very, very new stuff, like, you know, this, this OpenSea and, and what is happening with NFTs and all this stuff. And actually, not only that, but see a real world use case of what is happening, right? And, and this is something which I've, I've shared with Saurav sir as well of, of how, you know, this becomes very interesting, some of the concept of uh, this identity. And uh, let's see, uh, you know, for, with more interest, probably if we do a next session or, you know, we might work out that uh, the next series of Jagruta Divas when people come, actually for all the people who are attending it, uh, can actually get a proof of attendance right there. You know, you do 50 minutes <laughs> into the session and, and you will get a NFT token. So probably next time, uh, if things go well, we will definitely do that. Right? So with this, uh, again, I would like to uh, thank everyone who has come, especially director, sir, for taking the time and uh, uh, with those very motivating words. Uh, Dean, sir, is here. So thank you, sir, again. And of course, uh, Saurav, for uh, uh, being that, uh, you know, support and guidance and you know for you all and uh, helping us uh, uh, come and share this knowledge and uh, you know uh, build something very interesting for all of us right so thank you thank you again thank you thank you saurav and uh, let, let us first have a few questions if there are any we have already run out of time but i'm pretty sure uh, you know we can probably spare a couple more minutes if required sure 
Uh, so I just want to ask one question. Uh, what what if some student is going forward with the blockchain and uh, you know I have started with the learning solidity and what kind of tech stack he can learn uh, if he is going forward in the particularly Ethereum system if he is going forward. Very good. So if if you're starting with the Ethereum system first off, uh, you didn't tell me your name but uh, I see just as a K. So, okay, so it's Krishnanan, right? Uh, yeah, so it's me, Krishnanan, I'm tech student, first year. Very good. So, so, so you've already talked about Ethereum, so that's a great start. Uh, start earning solidity. Uh, and, and to build on the tech stack, uh, the blockchain system as well will give you most of it. We can talk about it a little bit detail offline. I can, you know, guide you through it. But in, in short, a start building on Ethereum, learn, you know, uh, how you can do a little bit of smart contracts, right? You know, just basic start learning. Deploy it on these uh, test nets, right? For example, uh, uh, we didn't get the time today, but something like, you know, you would see Ethereum skip the main net, but you can go to Rinkeby, right? It, it's a very good example. Uh, yeah, sir, I just uh, did some kind of uh, hands-on on Robston. Uh, Robston as well, again, that's, that's another one. So exactly start with those things. And the beauty of Ethereum-based systems is that there are many other blockchains which are built on that same protocol. So what you will actually try in, in test environment, you can just change the network and deploy it on, on in, in production, right? And so that is the infrastructure and that is what the beauty of that is, it's all taken care of. You don't have to build a database, you don't have to deploy a server, it is all there for you. The only thing that you have to build now is build your user interface, that's it. And that you can do with a with a React uh, JS system or Angular or, or even HTML JavaScript, right? Oh uh, yeah, yes, sir. this is the most fascinating thing, <laughs> exactly, because we just have to develop the front end and less uh, back end is already taken care. Uh, so one thing, one thing more which I want to ask sure. is uh, because th this particular technology is changing very fast. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of my friend who is in the, into this domain, he's saying that uh, like it, it is my personal question only. Uh, if we are going to learn Ethereum and somehow if, and after six months, if I ended up learning it, so uh, th there are more and more these uh, blockchain networks are coming up because there's there's one uh, thing which I heard Solana. And yes. there's, there's more and more are coming. It's like there are a few hundreds of them uh, right now. So is it going to be like uh, what if, if you're going to learn one thing, Ethereum, then we have to learn all, all those things also in order to go forward in, in particular this domain if, you're, if we want to go like in future aspect for career aspect. So is, is it isn't going to be very difficult for us to learn each and everything? No. So, so that's a great question, right? And it's a challenge. And, and typically, even prior to that, something which comes up, right? And and 10 years ago, if you were to enter the field of software development, you would most certainly start with something like uh, Java or the alternative was PHP, right? And then after a while, there, there's so many languages came. You know, you had Ruby, you have, today you have Python, uh, some of even nondescript stuff. And, you know, I when I was doing computer science, I used to learn something called basic. I think it was basic. Um, I, I don't even remember what else did I do. Uh, C++, yes, C++ is still I remember. <laughs> <laughs> and the fanciest thing I would make was that, uh, uh, you know, on this, uh, even the mobile phones are very small, but you used to have this snake games, right? Snake going around and something like that. And my biggest <laughs> fascination was I could use a C++ program to actually make the snake go around on the screen. And that was my kind of the project which I did as uh, for passing that uh, course, right? That was the best of it. So, but, the, but there are two things here, right? One is learning to understand the concept of how to do it. Now, the fact is, it's simple. I tell you, you want to get to number six, right? So you know that to get to number six, there are many ways, right? You could add one plus two plus three and get to six. You could add two plus four and get to six. You could multiply two times three and get to six, right? So what I'm saying is needing to know how is your ability. That's something which you grasp, which is the fundamentals, right? So all these things that you learn, uh, through the course that uh, Sir mentioned has already started, you'll grasp those fundamentals and how to do it. The second is the path, which is actually coming to what language, what stack you use, right? So what I'm trying to say is you can achieve the same objectives by going in different paths, right? So what you're saying, building a blockchain system, understanding what it does, the value it gives is one thing and that is at the foremost. You start with that, right? Coming back now, you said solidity is one thing which you will know and probably in six months, you will have a good ability to do that. Stick with that. Solana comes, some other comes, there are Rust-based system, there are C++, you can program in so many other things. It's a matter of learning a little bit of programming in a certain different language. But if you know how to write code, how to compose it, 
so that you can attain the same objective, it will be easier for you in the long term, right? End of the day, you do one plus two plus six or three plus three times two. It's a matter of how efficient you make it. And that is a choice which will always depend. There is no right or wrong answer to that. Something today with solidity can be done very beautifully. In six months, something else will come up and you know we will be building something else. Like 10, days, 10 years ago, PHP was the go-to stack for building business applications. Today, most likely it is Node.js, right? JavaScript, Merd, mean stack, right? So it has, it comes, there's nothing wrong. So you keep developing. But talking about Ethereum, if you stick with solidity, the overall understanding in the ecosystem is that Ethereum most likely will be the blockchain, which will kind of rule most of it, right? For all settlements. So stick with solidity and you will be taken care of for the most of it. Other systems, if you get time, of course, you can learn it. No challenges to it. Uh, other than that, the ones which are interesting are a little bit of Hyperledger and uh, Corda, which is, again, Java-based. So if you know a little bit of Java, you can, of course, jump into it. So if I were to tell you top three picks of what I would do anywhere from now learning in university to having something which would be a business relevance as well going forward is these three. Stick with Ethereum, Solidity, and Java for Hyperledger and, uh, and, and this thing. And of course, there are many tons of all blockchains out there. Believe me, you cannot learn everything. If you can, very good, but stick with these three and you should be fine. Rest of all, understand the business problem it solves. If there's no business problem, it is as good as you know a hobby, which is also fine, right? But if you're doing it for an end goal, think it uh, is as a business problem that it should solve, right? And then you should be fine. Okay, thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Okay, uh, I guess we have we have already run out of time. So uh, let us all, you know, thank Saurav. Uh, Saurav, thanks a lot for uh, being with us uh, again. And uh, we do look forward to have you probably, you know, sometime again. And we'll, as you have already said, uh, we can try to uh, make that next session could be slightly interactive or something like. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. something where we'll, we'll probably do something simultaneously along with you. Uh, and you have already given the students uh, uh, a very good uh, understanding towards what they can probably do, right? I mean, you've probably shown them maybe more than a dozen uh, application areas where blockchain could be useful. So so thank you, Saurabh. Uh, on behalf of IIT ISM, I would like to thank you. And uh, I just hope that we continue this uh, uh, this this whole series, you know, over a, over a large uh, number of let us interactions thank you thank you everyone who has come here uh, director sir um, arup sir everyone who has just uh, who joined us for this talk thanks a lot and uh, uh, i hope you will join us in the next iteration of cyber jack thank you thank you everyone thank, thank you. you thank you sir thank you very much thank you sir thank you